Our memory verse for the month of June is Luke chapter 6 and verse 40. It's on the board as we're discussing Jesus as teacher. Throughout, and we'll say it in a second, so don't, don't get ahead of me. Throughout the year, we're discussing more about Jesus. And we've talked about different aspects of his roles, different aspects of his identity. We've talked about him being God and man. We've talked about him being fulfilled prophecy. We've talked about him being teacher. These things are, are, are crucial to who we are because our identity is based upon his identity. Who he is helps us understand who we must be. The month of June, Jesus as teacher. Now, I did not this morning connect all the dots for you, but I hope you gathered some of the points from this morning had a lot to do with the fact that he was teaching and how he taught. Tonight, I want us to consider his example because he was a teacher who taught by example. And now, I want us to say, if you don't mind saying it with me, Luke chapter 6 and verse 40, a disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. And I appreciate that. I invite you to open your Bibles to John chapter 13. John, the 13th chapter. This section of Scripture, in many ways, begins Jesus' farewell address, if you wanted to call it that. And this is pretty common throughout Scripture. We see many of the great heroes of our faith doing these things. Moses does it with the book of Deuteronomy. You have Joshua do it at the end of the book of Joshua. You even have Paul do it. A farewell address is a pretty important... What's well, a pretty important sermon? Because as the individual is about to leave... These are the things he wants them to remember. He, these are the things he wants them to keep on their minds. With Moses, it was remember God's law. Remember the blessings and the cursings. In Joshua, it was remember God. You can go back to the gods across the river if you want to, but the whole ask for me in my house, we will serve the Lord. We, we need to serve Yahweh. Paul in 2 Timothy was the reminder of guarding the faith. With Jesus, in John chapter 13, you've got, you've got one of the most powerful examples ever given. And you've got some preaching that will follow it in chapter 14, 15, 16, 17. But the example that he gives in John chapter 13 is profound. You typically see a sovereign a king, a person who has the right to rule, you typically see them depicted on their thrones while everyone hustles around them, serving them. That's what you see in the book of Daniel with Nebuchadnezzar. That's what you see with Pharaoh, with the chief butler and chief baker in Joseph's day. In fact, that's what you see with David when he calls for Bathsheba. That's one of the reasons Bathsheba comes to him, because he's the king. He has the right to say, come to me. But in this scene with Jesus, it's not that way. In fact, I, I would submit to you that other than the cross, there is no greater demonstration of the humility of the servant spirit of our king than there is right here in John chapter 13. Folks, this right here is as good as it gets. The whole servant spirit of Christ, the, the servant spirit that we are to have ourselves, it's right here. I want us to have three considerations, three observations from this passage. This is not going to be profound or life-changing, but it's important. I want us to notice first and foremost the humility of our king. Let's begin in John chapter 13 and verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. 
After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Sometimes it's hard for us to imagine the scene there in John chapter 13. As he stoops down and washes the disciples' feet. Now, now one thing I want us to appreciate about this scene, just an overall observation, is the fact that what he's binding is not the action. He's binding the attitude. He's not binding foot washing. He's not saying that you need to do foot washing and we need to gather together and we need to actually literally take and wash each other's feet. That's disgusting. And I'm going to have a problem with that. But that's not what he's doing. It's the action. It's the attitude. I said it backwards that time. It's the attitude. I'm going to keep you on your toes tonight, apparently. The girls interrupted my nap. So if I derail this whole conversation tonight, you're, you're going to know, well, Devin got cut short this afternoon. About three or four minutes of a really good one, and then I was supposed to turn on Cinderella and wasn't awake, so they woke me up. It, it is the attitude, the attitude of a servant spirit, the attitude that says stoop down and be willing to serve those around you. I want us to appreciate one little statement that's made twice in this section that we just read. Verse 13 or verse 1, Jesus knew that the hour had come. Back over in chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands. You see that? Two different times it says what Jesus knew. When you think about the timeline of events that followed the crucifixion, and we've been talking about this in the Gospel of Mark Bible class because we've been reading through the last week leading up to the crucifixion. Folks, Jesus operated on the Father's timeline. He did everything according to the Father's timeline. He didn't get taken by lawless man or lawless hands and taken to the cross against His will. And sometimes we need to remember that. He was working according to the timeline that God the Father had appointed for him. He came to the earth according to God's timeline, and he went through this process according to God's timeline. And all of these little time statements, they're about the crucifixion. The hour in verse 1, the hour had come. The hour of what? Folks, the hour of the death of the burial, of the resurrection, ultimately of the ascension of Jesus Christ. And while all that is quite challenging, and in the human point of view, that's what it was. It was suffering. For somebody who kept things in perspective like Jesus, it was an opportunity of glorification. If you're open in chapter 13, look over at chapter 12 of John. In chapter 12... And verse 27, Jesus speaking, says, Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose, for this purpose, I came to this hour. He's talking about the same hour in chapter 13, verse 1. But verse 28, Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven and saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. You see, there's the glory aspect that Jesus is concerned about. Everything that Jesus did went back to the Father. He was concerned about the timeline of events of God. He was concerned about glorifying God the Father. And he was willing to suffer so that he could fulfill God's wishes. Jesus knew the hour had come. Chapter 13, verse 2. That's not the only thing Jesus knew. Chapter 13, verse 2, supper being ended, the devil having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and began to serve. Do you think Jesus was unaware of Judas' intentions? Well, for the record, the biblical account says he wasn't. He knew exactly what was going on. And in the parallel accounts, when you consider the the, the serving at the table, Jesus even says that one of you will betray me. Jesus knows not just that the hour has come, Jesus knows that it's going to be one of those men sitting with him that will betray him. But did that stop him from stooping to his knees and serving? 
Let me tell you something, folks. It's easy to serve those around us who love us. It's easy to serve those around us we respect. Can you imagine stooping down to your feet, stooping down to your knees to wash the feet of the man who puts you to the cross? Jesus knew. Now that statement in chapter 13 and verse 3 is quite powerful. Jesus knowing the Father had given all things into his hands. I want you to think about that statement. We'll come back to it in just a second. He had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God. You see something else Jesus knew? Our humble king knew where he came from and he knew where he was going. You see that? When you know where you're coming from and you know where you're going, it helps you persevere through the difficulties that are before you. Folks, do you, do you know what must have been on his mind while he was suffering and enduring the cross? We're talking about just a few hours before he goes to the cross at this point. But what Jesus knew helped him endure it. Sometimes, brethren, when we're going through very difficult circumstances, we've got to take a step back and remind ourselves who we are. R remind ourselves of who's really in charge. Remind ourselves of where we're ultimately going if we'll simply serve faithfully. Do you see the, hum the humble king in this story? What Jesus knew helped him determine what he would do. Can you imagine somebody in the place of authority, in the place of influence, in the place of power, stooping down to do the job that Jesus does here? Can you imagine, was it Jeff Bezos, the Amazon CEO? Can you imagine him stooping down and performing the menial task of a household servant? In a day where when the people came in from outside, they typically were greeted by a household servant who would then wash their feet because of the dirty roads and they walked in sandals. But here stands Jesus, willing to stoop down and wash feet. Can you imagine a president? Pick any one of them you want. Can you imagine somebody who is in a place of power, authority, and influence, stooping down, unbuckling the sandals on your feet and washing them. That statement in verse 3, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into His hands, the hands that created and sustained the world. All things were created through Him and by Him. Those same hands of power that molded Adam from the clay, the same hands that began the earth to spin and keeps it spinning. With those same hands, folks, he gets down on his knees. He fills up a basin with water. He lays a towel across his lap, and he begins to wash the feet of fishermen, of nobodies. And he spends a while doing it. And he dries them when he's done. The hands of our Creator. This is why I say, other than the cross, there is no more powerful scene than this one. He perfectly exemplifies Philippians chapter 2 who did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. But he made himself a servant. He came in the likeness of man. He humbled himself. And in, and in that passage, Paul says, humbles himself to the point of death on the cross. But folks, every day of his life was an act of humility. That's our king. That's the sovereign servant. That's the one we follow. Humility is not being kind, not just being kind to your inferiors. 
Humility is Jesus Christ who doesn't just treat those below him with kindness. When he comes to the earth, he doesn't push everyone lower. <laughs> he raises us up. I've seen this circulating Facebook the last few days. The only one who was qualified to throw a stone didn't. I don't know if you're a C.S. Lewis fan, but he used to say that Humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. Chew on that one a little bit. He is Lord. He is Master. He is King. He is the sovereignty. He is the standard of life. He is the creator of life. And yet, he serves those around him. Can we learn something from that? I would think so. The second observation I want us to consider is that holiness is required to approach God. In this continuing story in verse 6, Jesus gets to Simon Peter. And Peter says to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore he said, you are not all clean. I know that we read through stories of, of Peter and we think, what, what a goofball. But I don't know if that's always fair. For one, I relate to him. Maybe that's why I say that. But... Put yourself in those shoes, uh, pun intended. I didn't mean for that to happen, but it worked great. So put yourself in their sandals. What would you have done in their place, folks? Especially if you think about it on this side of the cross, knowing truly who he is. What would you do? If you were standing there, or sitting down perhaps, and he finally gets to you. Well, all the rest of those guys, you want to wash their feet, you go right ahead. But Lord, you're not washing my feet. He says, yeah, I am. Yeah, I am. I'm going to wash your feet. All of this, I think we can see very clearly, is symbolic of the cross. All of this is symbolic of what he would do, of his life, his death, his resurrection. Folks, all of that, all of that was the humility of the king. All of that was the servant spirit. All of that was about him helping mankind. He didn't come in the flesh just to see what it was like. He came in the flesh to save us. He didn't die or suffer on the cross and die and be buried in a tomb for his benefit. That was for ours. So this stooping down to wash feet, it, it's symbolic of, of everything that Jesus did. And all of it goes back to what he did for us. Now in the process of these events, Peter says, you're not going to wash my feet. Folks, we all should feel unworthy to an extent. But there is a huge difference between feeling unworthy and being unwilling. And we need to make sure we see that distinction. Truly, if we will live in mind of how unworthy we are, it can help us be more faithful. But if we are unwilling to accept what Jesus offers, well, folks, we're lost. And there is nothing that can help you. In fact, Jesus says, What I'm doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, verse 8, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Folks, the whole purpose that Jesus came and served mankind was so that we could be washed by him. 
If you want to connect this poetically to being baptized for the mission of sins, being cleansed in the blood of Christ, I think you could. But there's redemptive work involved in that. The saving us from our sins. Brethren, we cannot be saved without His sacrifice. We cannot be saved without His service. We cannot be saved unless we are willing to come and meet Him on His terms. Submitting to Him. That statement in verse 10. He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore, he said, you are not all clean. Now, again, that's a reference to Judas. There's no question about that. But what I want us to appreciate is that cleansing aspect of coming to Christ. We live in a sin-filled, polluted world. And in order to come to Him, in order to be in fellowship with Him, in order to have that relationship with Christ, we have got to be cleansed from our sins. We're part of the new priesthood, Mark. Part of the new priesthood. <laughs> That's between me and him. That's none of y'all's business. That's an inside joke, I guess. But we're part of the new priesthood. And let me say, folks, if you go back to the Old Testament, the old priests in the Levitical days still had to be washed in the laver before they could approach God in service in the temple. Folks, we're to be cleansed before put into service. And that cleansing takes place in the blood of Christ for the remission of sins by His grace. And only then can we approach God. Holiness looks like Jesus. The third observation I want us to make is the happiness that is achieved by doing both of those previous things. Recognizing the humility of our King and pursuing holiness. The end result is happiness. This is a poor translation, but we're going to use it anyways. Verse 12, Matthew thir or John 13, verse 12. So when he had washed their feet, he had taken his garments and sat down again. He said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, happy are you if you do them. Most translations use the word blessed there in that verse. Blessed are you if you do them. The idea is acceptance, accepted by God. Accepted by God are you if you do these things. Now Jesus essentially says, do you know what I've just done to you? And bless their hearts, as is the case with most of the other things that Jesus did for them and to them. I don't think they got it. <laughs> but oftentimes we struggle with getting it. And we see the full picture, or at least we have the full picture of Scripture given to us. The example that Jesus set for those men the teachings of Jesus, if we, will, if we will understand them, if we will seek to apply them in our lives, it can bring happiness. It can bring contentment. It can, can, it can bring acceptance by God. In fact, that's a Psalm chapter 1 and verses 1 through 3 principle. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of God. And in that law, he meditates day and night. Folks, we, we hang our hat on that one. On focusing on God and His Word. Eternal blessings are to the individual who obeys God's laws. I know that in our world today, we are really wrapped up in how many people serve us. How many people wait on us hand and foot. In fact, I, I can't say a whole lot. I like going to restaurants so that I have somebody waiting on me and the children instead of me waiting on the children at home. We, we like to be served. But we must understand, folks, and I'm not talking about something harmless like restaurants, but we must understand, folks, that true contentment, that true joy, that true happiness comes by serving others. 
I, I came across an article this past week that talks about CEOs and how they have a, I think it was 20% higher depression rate than the general public. Think about that. The most influential individual in the company, the most powerful individuals in the company, and yet, generally speaking, are more depressed than the rest of the people in the company. Now, that may not impact any of us in our day-to-day -day life, but there's a principle there. What kind of things are we teaching those children that are coming up? Money and power bring happiness? We see that brainwashed in all of our children everywhere else in the world. Are we doing anything to prevent that from being the mindset that happens in our home? Folks, true happiness, this selfish the selfishness that is so toxic in our society, it's so prevalent today. It's no wonder so many people are miserable. It's no wonder so many people struggle with happiness. It's no wonder so many people struggle with contentment. Because all they can look out for is themselves. There's one thing in Christianity you have the right to be selfish about. It's your own soul. Everything else about serving Christ is about serving others. I don't know if we always appreciate that. I don't know if we always keep that into consideration. Even that statement that Jesus makes in verse 16, Most assuredly I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. Folks, Jesus took the lower place in the world so that he could bring everyone else up, so that he could elevate us. Maybe some allusions to Ephesians 2 there. He's raised us up to sit in the heavenly places with Him. Do we always stop and appreciate that, folks? The humility of the King. The holy lifestyle that He presented for us as an example. And as He even says in verse 14, I washed your feet, you also ought to wash another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. The attitude... The attitude of Christ, the approach that Christ had to this life is the very one that we ought to have ourselves. And even in that statement in verse 17, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. There's a difference in knowing things and applying the things you know. But that blessedness, that, can, that acceptance by God only takes place by applying the things God has given to us. If you wanted a simple take home for this lesson, it is serve others. Maybe a few things for you to do. Sometimes I'm, I, I think this way. I struggle with, okay, you just preached a sermon. What do you want me to do with that? All right, here's what I want you to do with this. Here's something you can do. You can take notes during the announcements. We put a little screen on the slides that revolves before services. Take notes during announcements. Write down individuals that need something. You can send them cards. I struggle with making phone calls sometimes because if I'm in my office, I'm, I'm focusing on what I'm doing. If I'm not in my office, I have two Tasmanian devils running around who, who seem to make a lot of noise. So send cards. Make phone calls. Send some food if you're a good cook. If you're not a good cook, just send some love. Let them know that you love them. You're there to support them. You're there to encourage them. Go visit someone. That's been tough the last two years. It's beginning to get a little easier. Go visit some people. The whole point is to see what we can do for those who are around us, to see whose foot we can wash, or feet we can wash. <laughs> it's to see what we can do for those that need. Brethren, the, the, the formula for joy, the formula for contentment, is seeing the humility of Christ, our King, following in that example of humility. It is pursuing holiness. 
It is recognizing that there is a standard for life and doing everything you can to live within it. If, if we can excel at those two points, being accepted by God is what will follow. Happiness, contentment, joy, those things follow the servant heart. They outflow from it. It may be that you have been plagued by selfishness. That's a struggle that we all fight at times. But it has dominated your life. Well, we want to encourage you to make that right, to fix that, to come to the humble king and pursue humility yourself. It may be that you've done those things in the past and have went back into this world. Well, we would still want to encourage you to come to the humble king. If we can assist you in some way this evening, we would love to, if you're willing to come forward now as we stand and as we sing.